The Soul Foundation held their first annual symposium at Stanford University. We're going to be finding out what the Soul Foundation is and some of the things that they discuss because it's very exciting. Hey, this is Patrick with Vetted. Thank you so much for jumping in. Hit that like button if you like our content. And please comment down below what you think of the Soul Foundation's first uh, symposium, their first event, their first conference. Had a lot of speakers, so let me know what you guys think. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. We put out a new video every day at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, USA. Let's jump in. All right, so Soul Foundation's first annual symposium, Stanford University, November 17th and 18th, 2023. So let's jump in and just get some, you know, details uh, about what happened. All right, so first let's just find out what is the Soul Foundation, okay? What is the Soul Foundation? I got their website here. Again, I'll be putting links to everything that I show. Um, so again, we're gonna take a look at this, what the Soul Foundation is. This is the the big one we're gonna be taking out, uh, checking out is this um, this video, okay, that was made by Joe Murkia, all right? UFO that the UFO Joe um, and it has the best explanation. So I've got a bunch of clips timestamps from this hour and a half video that he did uh, after the conference. So again, we're just going to be taking it different things that he said. I think that's the best summarization of of the event so far. Um, and I've got some other tweets. We're just going to look at of people the response of what happened in that. And there's this slide that's floating around that everyone's talking about. So we're going to be looking at that too. Uh, but what is the Soul Foundation? It's confirmation that genuine unidentified aerial phenomena exist and would be world changing in every sense of the term. The Soul Foundation marshals intellectual insight and policy expertise to meet the scientific and political challenges. Launch announcement. So the Soul Foundation launches to research unidentified aerial phenomena. New Scientific Foundation will convene world-class scholars and civil service experts to conduct academic studies into the implications of UAP. Organization will also provide tangible policy recommendations to government leaders based on its cutting-edge research. All right, so August 15th, 2023. Today marks the launch of the Soul Foundation, a new think tank that has been established to research the philosophical policy and scientific implications of unidentified aerial phenomena or UAP, or as most people know them, UFOs. That's right. Led by Dr. Gary Nolan, professor in the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Medicine and sociocultural anthropologist, Dr. Peter Scoffish. Soul Foundation is assembling teams of world-class academics and government experts, including former Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, Charles McCullough III, serving as legal counsel, to conduct research and provide policy expertise around UAP, as well as help, help set the ad agenda for the wider study of UAP. As the revelation of the reality of UAP is likely to be world-changing in every sense of the term, Soul Foundation's mission is to be a leading source of research on the issue, while providing the most informed and insightful policy recommendations to governments. The Foundation will encourage greater government transparency, drive collaborative sharing, and review of academic insight, and champion methodical, scientifically robust assessment and analysis. As governments begin to acknowledge and openly discuss UAP, the time has come for serious and credible academic research into the potential nature of UAP and the broad implications for science and policy, said Gary Nolan, executive director of the board at Soul Foundation. We are committed to helping guide the public conversation on a mass scale in terms that everyone can understand. So again, I'll put a link to this uh, entire thing um, so you can read it all, find out what's going on. But um, yeah, let's look at some tweets here of people just excited about this, really, right? Uh, again, this is Carl Nell, who I made a, a video about, retire, retired lieutenant colonel um, in the Army, okay, um, who potentially could be, he's one of the potential replacements for Sean Kirkpatrick at Arrow. all right, so... He did a slide that everyone's kind of trying to figure out. And again, this picture was not supposed to go out. A video of this event is supposed to come out later. And they told everyone, please don't live tweet this. Please don't take any pictures. And what did people do? 
they started to tweet out and take pictures exactly what they were told not to do um and here's a you know a look at this this slide okay someone took it and then made their own based off of what they could see in that slide right so this slide right here okay that you can't really see someone made this and it links to um a reddit post too that someone made like a text version of it again i'll put links to all this so you guys can check it out uh, but we're not really going to go over that too much um, we're going to go over that video with uh, the UFO Joe because that uh, honestly has the best stuff in it. So, again, just some quick things for people that, you know, uh, Alex Dietrich, she was one of the uh, pilots in the Nimitz encounter. OK, packing up my soul conference swag and heading to the airport. This really felt like a proper academic conference. Curious, respectful, collaborative. Well done, Gary P. Nolan. Boom. Have you seen a UFO? So there's some of their swag. Joe Murcia, the UFO Joe. Again, we're going to be watching this video. Congrats to Gary Nolan and the rest of the folks at Seoul for putting on a fantastic conference. Looking forward to more in the future. Going to go through my notes and try to get some long form tweets out before I drive home today. So, yes, some great stuff. Uh, Ryan Graves, the Seoul Foundation Conference was a wonderful success by all accounts. Congrats to Gary Nolan and the rest of the Seoul team on what I hope will be the first of many. So this is that photo again that was not supposed to go out. Um, J.I. says, I got to ask David Grush a question. He was the surprise guest speaker at the Soul Foundation Conference. I asked him why he did it. He said because of the values instilled in him in the military. He didn't want to look back 30 years later and regret not doing anything. Boom. So this guy, uh, you know, wrote some stuff here. Again, let's just go over this video with UFO Joe. This explains so much, but I'll put links to some of these tweets so you guys can can read it. Because um, it has the best stuff. All right, all right, let's let's jump in here. All right, 721. I got again, I got a bunch of timestamps here, y'all. Hang on. Aliens. But it's really not about aliens, it's about us. Love each other. Not yet. I got to get to the, well, let me go to the exact point. 721 here. Especially people who are different. All right, right here. Now, he brought the spherules that he collected to be studied. What's Mass that? spectrometer at Harvard by Mr. Jacobson. Didn't get the fuck, guys. So this is Avi Loeb he's talking about. His name. And now they have 800 spherules, and they've studied about... So these are the spherules that he got in Papua New Guinea. I interviewed Avi Loeb uh, last spring, and he was talking to me about this trip and how he was going to go to Papua New Guinea to look for these spherules, right? It was an interstellar object that they had deemed interstellar that had come through the atmosphere and landed, crashed into the ocean in Papua New Guinea, and they were going to go basically scour the bottom, right? Of the ocean and see if they could find it with a big magnet. And they did. They found a bunch of stuff right that they've studied 93 percent of them some of them are spheres inside spheres small spheres solidified first and he showed some pictures and he found the iron isotope had a different ratio than rocks on earth the mars i mean earth mars or the moon some spherules he called them belau show that they were associated with an explosion maybe a meteor and if any that's interesting, right? Boom. So that's one little update. Again, there's just a bunch like this. Um, so different people that spoke. He's basically just going over the different people that spoke. Okay, why is this acting like this? Come on, y'all. My apologies here. Let's hit that again. Okay, here we go. 14... Oh. No, these are unlikely right. and a skeptical rotating dish anyway right, here we rotating go. dish anyway it's a paper that they wrote and it is accepted at least so if you see at least four of these objects in a picture she said it's a good sign that it's transient hang on let me let me go back so you know who who he's talking about here okay what is going on with this thing 
killing me. All right, 1102. Just kidding. They said. Okay, right everything. here. Right here. Um, all right. Beatrice Villaras from Sweden has a PhD in astronomy. This is something I had never heard. So that's that's who he's talking about in this part right here. All right, let's go into it. Um, predicting. Pre Predicted signature of an of ET probes. Um, this is I don't know what the hell this is. Multiple in a line from a rotating dish. Anyway, it's a paper that they wrote and it is accepted. At least, so if you see at least four of these objects in a picture, she said it's a good sign that it's transient. Um, and the top two candidates for this happening was August 6, nineteen fifty four, and July twenty eighth, nineteen fifty two. And she said, once you get a positive result, the mainstream journals get nervous because it, it doesn't even get to the review process. They're so against the possibility that these could be ET probes and unmanned probes. They're, they're, they're in our skies. They're up there. And she talks later. She wants to bring one down. I was like, what? And I'm thinking... At first, I was thinking craft with people, some some being inside, but these are unmanned probes. They believe if they're even probes. So that's interesting. If you see four of them, they're transient. I'm not sure what some of this means, but I don't know. Have you ever heard anything like that uh, before? Uh, that was the first time I had heard anything like that. Um, all right, real quick. Okay, right here. Go further on that. This is probably the biggest takeaway from Knut's lecture. He said the United States government's said to UAPX, they wanted to know what are your capabilities for observing underwater? That question came up over and over. So there's some focus. Somebody knows there's a focus on underwater objects. And Knuth speculated that maybe electric fields are swamping the instruments and making them useless when they're trying to get measurements. That's interesting. So underwater objects were discussed a lot at this Soul Foundation. Um, all right, next one here. The last clip I have is the longest. And it's supposedly the best part. So stay with me here, y'all. Um, Grush couldn't be here because of travel issues. Which that's interesting, right? Grush couldn't show up because of travel issues. I hope it wasn't a flight, y'all. Just kidding, but <laughs> right? Um, that's interesting. How could he not be there? He's part of the Soul Foundation, David Grush is. He's listed as being uh, part of the Soul Foundation. So the very first symposium, David Grush can't be at this. That's that is interesting. What sort of travel issues? Thanks. And he said, Nolan's lecture, what's inevitable? So, all right, that that's, oh, oh. Have y'all ever heard, listen to this. Have y'all ever heard, have y'all ever heard of this? I don't know what a dragon UAP is. Oh, Christian mentioned that. What is a dragon UAP? It doesn't get mentioned again um, here. But I've never heard of a dragon UAP, y'all. That's that's brand new to me. So tell me in the comments. Does someone know what that is? Dragon UAP? Very interesting. All right, let's go to the next one. Gosh darn it. This is a lot harder than y'all think, I promise. Why? Every time they offload something, it's different. And then he brought up a case, which I did not know they had. Okay, right here. Studied material. The Sakuro, Sakuro Lani Zamora case, which I think was 1964. This is Gary Nolan he's talking about. Anyway, Zamora sees an object and saw it landed, and then it took off. They, anal they analyzed something that was left at the site. Don't know if it was a piece of the craft. They, they weren't sure about that. 
And in that sample, the contaminants are what's interesting. Aluminum is, the aluminum is incredibly, incredibly pure. You know, who does that and why? And it was attached to zinc with aluminum in, aluminum in it, but it's not uniformly distributed. Why? Clear signs of engineering, clearly a result of an industrial process. It had an un unusual level of pure silicon with contaminants that are in inappropriately distributed. And there are, there are many kinds of atomic imaging. I don't know what that means. He says there's a new effort. He's calling it the Stardust Repository. Y'all heard of this? The Stardust Repository. This is brand new. The thing is made of stardust. And he wants to standardize testing with a federation of labs and analysis tools and do some deep vetting to make sure they're not getting junk samples. It'll be organized under a public umbrella operation. He wants to standardize it and put out protocols so others can do it. It'll be funded by gifts and grants and wants to make the data freely available at once or after the owner writes a paper, but long, the most people will have to wait is one to two years. And he says he's not a metal, metal, oh, metallurgist. He goes, but others with expertise in various fields have offered to help. That is it for Gary Nolan. So that's it for Gary Nolan. All right. Um, and then they also talk about how Kirkpatrick, nobody brought up Sean Kirkpatrick, just FYI, how that, that he was not brought up at all. And again, this Soul Foundation event, it had government officials too, non-government officials and government officials, FBI, CIA, DOD, Pentagon, right? Like there's a lot of different people there, probably from the different armed forces, um, all interacting together. That's quite interesting. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Jacques Vallée, some comments about Jacques Vallée. Again, stay with me. I've got some more. Um, the stuff with Hal Putoff is the most interesting. We'll, we'll get to that in just a second. All right, right here. It's close enough. Sorry. In Forbidden Science, Volume 5, you mentioned the Blue Border Legacy Special Access Program. What is that? Bele says, I don't want to talk about anything classified in this lecture, but I went to D.C. and briefed folks in the Senate who had questions like that. That's all he said. That's all he said. All right. Um, Diana Pasulka, I think that's her name. Gosh, I always get that wrong. Love her interviews, by the way. Um, all right. Hang on, y'all. Oh, oh, oh. Almost had it. Almost had it. Right there. That's close enough. Pasolka, up next. One said that Diana was the uh, first entry for me into the non-material world and the esoteric. He said, we've gone out together into the desert in blindfolds because the person who took us didn't want us to know where we were going. One of the more remarkable, remarkable trips I ever took, that was Nolan introducing her. And she goes, that's ironic because it, it's not necessarily the non-material side of it because I did take it to a crash retrieval site, allegedly. And she spoke about the rewriting of the myth of Prometheus and started off by saying, I'm going to use UFOs and UAP interchangeably because Jay Stratton is not here, so I think I can get away with it. So Diana Pasulka went with Gary Nolan. They got put bags over their heads and went out to supposed crash retrieval, a crash site and got samples that happened a while ago. All right, let's see here. Oh, the next part's coming up. So I'm just going to leave it here. Since the mid 20th century, there have been roughly four tradition traditions to relate it to UFOs. Of course, I don't have all four because I'm, This part uh, right here. Paper she recently, I want to see this paper. She wrote a paper for Oxford and it was peer reviewed by someone on Avi's team. She goes, So this is Pasolka still that she wrote this paper. Which may be horrifying, 
horrifying to you, Avi. <laughs> I didn't hear if he responded. He goes, it's, she goes, it's a history of this research that she does. Uh, Leslie Kane helped with it. And so did the folks and the invisible college and the visible college. Uh, there's a, she goes, there's a compartmentalization in academia and UAPs and UFOs. It's extreme. And it's because of stigma and national security in academia. The compartmentalization is people in astrobiology, as an example, they're unaware of what people are doing in the public realm of UFO research and vice versa. We don't know what those folks are doing, but it's necessary for researchers to learn from each other. Diana feels vindicated for being asked to speak at Seoul. All right. So the stigma is brought up again. Yes, there is a stigma everywhere. All right, right here. And Peter Scoffish, his lecture was tough. It was called Conceptualized. So Peter Scoffish is the guy, one of the guys who helped put this event on. Okay. So NHI, anthropomorphism and ontolo ontolo ontology. Really quick, I didn't take a lot of notes because he was mostly reading an essay and it was just hard. To, it was almost impossible to take notes for me. Uh, Schumer, Senator Schumer has brought UAP further into the public discourse. It has taken the terminology and made it a matter of significance to Congress and the office of the president. What is supposed to be myth may be real and it raises an ontological problem. Who or what is this that operates them? And I think this is really a great essay to read it was tougher to follow as he was reading it but it, to actually read it i would like to read it um who or what is what the guys this thing is just twitter is acting up today y'all i'm telling you. each other and prometheus that hasn't been established yet no, hang on i want to actually address. read it i would like to read it here we go um who or what is operating these craft or objects or phenomena is it threatening? Is it beneficial? But if Majority Leader Schumer can write legislation about it, nobody should be nobody should feel embarrassed by talking about it. Despite the low, lack of social consensus that UAP are physical objects, he assumes for the talk he gave that they are, and we're conceiving both NHI and UAP through categories that, and it leads to an anthropomorphic loop. We're looking at everything through the eyes of a human, which. We have no other way of looking at them, obviously. Do we even have the right concepts to make sense of this all? The problem is not that the witnesses are not witnessing objects that appear to be technological. It's the idea that people think UAP are only technological machines, when in fact they may be part biological and possibly involving thought. That's fascinating, right? If y'all saw the movie, Jordan Peele's movie, Nope, right, where the UFO turns out to be the actual alien itself. I love that idea. I honestly had not, before that, I had not thought of that or heard that anywhere. So that was like really cool. So yeah, this idea that some of these objects are the aliens themselves, you know, not necessarily, right, machines with beings inside. I mean, there's a lot of different theories, right, and that could be controlled by thought. I mean, it's insane. That's insane. So, yes, would love to read that essay. Peter Scoffish, for sure. I'm with him. All right, this is the last clip, y'all. This, this is the bread and butter here. It's like six, seven minutes, but it is well worth it. Um, Joe said it's the best part of, you know, the conference here. So let's get to it. Again, I'll put a link to, you can watch this full video from Joe. It's over an hour and a half long. I watched the whole thing, and these are the parts that I thought were interesting. Um, there's a lot, lot to it, though. All right, right here. Here we go. All right, last clip, y'all. Here we go. And let me know what y'all think of this conference. It sounds like it was really cool, really great. It sounds like we need more things like this, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. yeah, unbiased. So Hal says, back in the 60s, we had, in the 60s, we had. So this is Hal Putoff he's talking about. Sign, Grudge, and Blue Book. In 69, Blue Book, Blue Book shut down after recommendations by Khan.
The Air Force would tell you they gave up studying UFOs in 1969, but the Bolander memo says they would continue with any UFO study that's related to national security. So Project Blue Book didn't die. It just went out of sight. So and I, I've, I think this is in Valet's book. So Project Blue Book didn't die, just went out of sight, still going strong. That's interesting. That's very interesting. He said he was contacted by... It's interesting. The most interesting part of the day, I think. He said they were contacted or he was contacted. I'm so sorry for all these pauses, y'all. That's not me. Hal was by a CEO of a think tank in, think tank in Washington, D.C. a couple of decades ago. And he said, hey, come participate in this conference. Jeez, y'all. I mean, why does it keep doing that? Does anyone have any reason why this keeps resetting on Twitter on all on its own? I'm not doing anything. It's so annoying. Come on, Elon. This fixed, dude. Security. So Project Blue Book didn't die. It Sorry, just went out of sight. So and he's, I've, I think this is in Valet's book. He said he was contacted by this is this is interesting. The most interesting part of the day, I think. All right, let him have his drink of water again, y'all. Okay. Let's do an hour and a half live stream. He said they were contacted or he was contacted, Hal was, by a CEO of a think tank in think tank in Washington, DC a couple of decades ago. And he said, Hey, come participate in this conference. He goes, but I can't tell you what it's about. But if you come, you will consider it the most important thing you've ever done. So put off goes 15 to 20 people featuring the military, the CIA, the DIA, businessmen. They make up these 15 to 20 people. And when he gets there, Hal's told the conference is the conference is about whether or not to disclose the reality of UFOs to the American people. And he says, they said, let's start out. This is what they told the people at the conference. Let's start out and assume that there have been crash retrievals from Russia, China. They have their crash retrievals. Can we bring this out to the public? And we want to rate the impact of various things from positive to negative. How will it affect stocks, the stock market, religion, politics? He said it was a really long list. What happens if Corporation A has access to crash retrieval materials and Corporation B doesn't? And then B will wind up suing A and sue the government. Lou has spoken about this. And so they broke up into groups. His group, they ended up with a negative number, not in, fa not in favor of disclosure. And that was you know, a negative number, but the group he was in, they were made up of folks who were positive on disclosure, but when they got down to it, it came out to be not, not ruling in favor of disclosure. In fact, so that's interesting. So it's like a group of people, right? Okay. So a CEO of a think tank out of Washington, this is early 2000s. Okay. So Hal put up is saying two decades ago, so early 2000s, and they're trying to figure out if they can, should release this to the public, right? So they create this huge list of the different variables, right? Religion, stock market, you know, society, whatever, right? Um, all these different things, uh, education, right? Everything. And then give it, you know, plus or minus basically. And then at the end you add up and see, oh, would it be a negative or positive response uh, if we disclose this, right? So you have people that want to disclose, but they're trying to figure out the impacts that it would have. And then go off that. It's not very mathematical, right? Just very analytical. So it's not that, I mean, that must be true, right? It, there must be people that want disclosure, but just feel it just, it can't happen. It can't happen. The effects that it would have would just be too great, right? On too many parts of society, right? That they can't control. It's too many parts. Every group came up with a negative number. And the problem basically was there's so many areas to handle 
and there's no way to handle them. I mean, seriously, th this thing stinks, y'all. I'm telling y'all. Yeah, I'm biased. He goes, but I can't tell you what it's about. But if you come, you will consider it the most important thing you've conference. Let's start out and assume that there have been access to crash retrieval materials and Corporation B doesn't. And then B will wind up suing A and sue the government. Lou has spoken about this. And so they broke up into groups. His group, they ended up with a negative number, not in, fa not in favor of disclosure. And that was, you know, a negative number. But the group he was in, they were made up of folks who were positive on disclosure. But when they got down to it, it came out to be not, not ruling in favor of disclosure. In fact, every group came up with a negative number. And the problem basically was there's so many areas to handle and there's no way to handle them all at the same time. Therefore, we all recommend that we do not go forward with this. Well, that was the recommendation at the top after they looked at all of their, their um, individual group recommendations. And Hal was like, yeah, we were disappointed. We started out thinking when we got there that it was a good thing to do, but afterwards we changed our minds. So you can blame put off for no disclosure. I'm only kidding. <laughs> but that's that's an interesting story. And I don't know how much things have changed since then. Fast forward to 2008 and you had Harry Reid, Inoue and Stevens who put off reminds us they were all part of the gang of eight. So they probably had some background that was that this was a good idea starting the offset program. So they told DIA, the DIA to start it. The DIA requirements were, you know, they want to know where they're coming from, intent, but that wasn't as big as an interest as number two. They wanted to know what other countries are interested in it, and if they get a hold of this technology, will they be able to leap ahead of us? And Hal thinks they must have known something to make up the list of DIRDs that they came up with, the 38 DIRDs, which were lift, propulsion, power generation, all these papers, um, space-time materials, signature reduction, human effects, human interface, human interface. And Hal says, we thought maybe other countries do have materials. So his job was to, to get those materials from either companies or parts of the government that had them allegedly get the materials so OSAP could study them. But it was so compartmentalized, he said they couldn't do it. He said some folks had, you know, in their corporations or wherever had in the basement of the companies where this stuff was hidden. And they wanted to bring it out to the main part of the company, but they couldn't do that. Same problem, compartmentalization and classified, blah, blah, blah. That's interesting. I don't know if I've ever heard that before, which that makes total sense is that, I don't know if you caught that, but like that even Lockheed Martin or, you know, Skunk Works, whatever company, aerospace company you want to pick, right? They're even hiding it from their own people. So it's even a secret within their own company, right? It's secret within secret. So it's even compartmentalizing their own companies. That's interesting. And that, again, that totally makes sense. Um, and they even offered a, a way through the front door where these places could give it to OSAP and they wouldn't tell anybody where it was from. They would provide them cover. I mean, seriously, this, it, it just, everybody, includes the various Twitter. things. I, I hate Twitter right now. I'm hating X right now. This thing keeps apologies. Y'all. Okay. I think it was right here more or less classified blah 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 and they even offered a, a way through the front door where these places could give it to OSAP and they wouldn't tell anybody where it was from they would provide them cover that didn't entice them and the last plan was let's go to all the instead of that we'll just go to all these experts and have them write papers on you know and tell us what you're field would be in the next, I think 2050 was it, or 50 years ahead in the future. 
And then he goes through all the dirge. And that's what they wound up doing. They didn't get the materials. And they published it on JWix, which is the in-house top secret place where you could publish top secret and sensitive government papers and stuff. And those were extremely popular papers. And Hal was worried that these authors later would find out because they weren't told it was about UFOs. He was worried they would say, oh, my God, you didn't tell us this was related to UFOs. But he never got that pushback. And he says those papers turned out to be almost as good as if they would have been able to share the materials to be analyzed. I don't know if I believe that. But now he says, now we have David Grush saying we have materials, craft, and bodies. He's not the only one. Jim Lukatsky, who ran OSAP, he also talked about craft in the new Knapp Kelleher Lukatsky book, Initial Revelations. And Lukatsky said, basically, we have craft of unknown origin and we've got inside of it. He said that in 2011, where they had a meeting at the Capitol with a senator and I think it was a deputy Department of Defense person. Anyway, Putoff says, we have all these reasons to take this seriously and expect something is going to come out in the public. With the Schumer Amendment, I can't believe it. That's what he said. You know, non-human intelligence, that appears over 20 times in the legislation. If that passes, things will move forward at a relatively rapid clip. But, and I've heard mixed things about whether or not that will pass. It's, it's mixed right now what aspects will pass, imminent domain, the whole thing, I don't know. But even if it, pa even if it passes, Hal says. So he's talking about, right, the Schumer legislation that was enacted. I think it got approved in the House. It still needs to be approved in the Senate, right? And it will be part of the National Defense Authorization Act that gets signed at the, basically the end of December. It's ready for the new year. Um, so that's the legislation that's talking about that, right? Chuck Schumer. Um, and yeah, it has basically like a whole way to unfold disclosure to the public, right? With the special board of people that will look at different cases and evidence and whatever, and then decide what to disclose out to people and whatnot. It provides, um, you know, what you're talking about eminent domain about the government being able to just go to these private companies and say, you have a UFO, we're taking it. That's it. It's ours, right? or you have materials, that's ours. You have an alien body, that's ours. But it also protects them, right? There's no like, they would be arrested or, you know, law, you know, charges brought against them for having this material. It just means the government would go in and take it and it would be the government's. Um, so yeah, we're waiting to see if that passes. God, this, this is just disgusting. You know, honestly, that's really the end of it, y'all. That's really the end of the clip anyway. Um, again, I'll put link to this so you can see the whole thing. It's an hour and a half. Well worth watching. Um, it's a little slow, but he's tired after, you know, being at the conference, and he did that. So, I, you know, big credit to him um, for throwing that video out. He did not have to do that. And I think that's the best video explaining a lot of the different stuff and who, who spoke and what they spoke about um, that's out there. Um, so again, we'll wait and see till the actual video comes out. We'll be able to really dissect it. Um, and I'm very excited for that to come out, to be honest with you. Um, probably the most excited about that of anything, if I'm being honest, this is where I feel, you know, our, our eyes and ears should go are these type of conferences, events, right? These kind of conversations scientifically based looking at the data ignoring all the nonsense you know like mh370 stuff and all of that like you know we just got to ignore the nonsense the stuff that's like obviously nonsense like just ignore it and let's focus on this stuff getting disclosure through the government right this, this is what we need so I don't know, I'm curious to hear everyone's opinions and thoughts about this and the comments um, about this conference. Um, again, uh, we haven't really seen it, right? So we only know just a few things that they talked about. Um, but yeah, very excited, cannot wait to um, see the video of this and uh, you know, see all the different slides and see all the different details and when they think disclosure is coming, when it's not, um, there's some different dates floating around. Um, so yeah.
All right, guys, this is Patrick with Vetted. Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, remember, every day's a gift. I'll be back with another video tomorrow, 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you guys so much for watching and listening. Again, if you haven't already, hit that like button. Comment down below what you think of the Soul Foundation Conference and some of the things that were mentioned. And if you think this is the direction it should be going. All right. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Let's go, y'all. Trying to get to 2,000. All right. As always, every day is a gift. Peace.